Hi again, Erev Shabbos, everybody. Um, getting in the uh, recording a little bit early this week. Um, welcome to Jerry's Parsha Ponderings for Parsha's Vaera. Um, this week's Parsha has a whole lot of interesting stuff. I mean, every Parsha does, but uh, we're going to start with the Makos and uh, just the whole real backstory on Moshe Rabbeinu, which uh, I think is really fascinating. So um, right in the beginning of the Parsha, Hashem says something very interesting. And uh, my daughter Shandy will remember this very well because uh, it was something that uh, we spoke about a great deal as this is her Bat Mitzvah Parsha. Hashem tells B'nai Yisrael, in the Arba Lashonot of Geula, the four, uh, the four different uh, phrasings of redemption, Ani Hashem, I am Hashem, v'hotzeiti etchem mitachat sivlot Mitzrayim, v'yitzalti etchem me'avodatam, v'goalti etchem b'zroa natuya v'shvatim g'dolim, v'lakachti etchem li la'am, v'hayiti lachem le'elohim, v'yedatem, it continues, ki ani Hashem alokechem, ha'motzi etchem mitachat, Sivlot Mitzrayim again, and then it goes on to say, "Veheveti etchem el haaretz." The big question, of course, is: Are there four lashonot of Geula, or are there five lashonot of Geula? Um, but let's just back up for a second and talk about this whole idea of mitachat sivlot Mitzrayim. What is sivlot Mitzrayim? Lisbol is to tolerate something. I can't, I can't tolerate it. So when it's, Hashem says, I'm taking you, it, it, the, the Pasuk would have read very nicely if it would have said, or if it would have said, or if it would have said, uh, or Shibud Mitzrayim. Why does it say Sivlot? What is this word Sivlot? So I heard uh, from, uh, I believe it was initially um, one of my Rabbanim of Moshe Meir Weiss, Shlita. He said that, and I, I, I want to make sure I'm not 100% sure of that, but uh, Let's say uh, that it's. Uh, let's say that it is indeed the case. The tolerance of Egypt, Sivlot Mitzrayim, the Bnei Yisrael had become accustomed to being slaves. I mean, they, they were already uh, quite a few generations into this, and they tolerated it. It was to them. It was the normal thing. So Hashem. And during the whole Geula process, from the time Moshe Rabbeinu appears on the scene as the deliverer, if you will, until Kabbalah Torah, there was basically a deprogramming. Hashem had to deprogram Bnei Yisrael from being slaves to being a mamlechet kohanim v'gai kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's a quite a that that's quite a uh, turnaround there uh, in a relatively short period of time. But I want to take it one step further. Mitachat sivlot mitzrayim, tolerating living in Galut, tolerating the exile. And as we know, as we said in last week's Parsha, the, everything went sideways the minute that Bnei Yisrael became too comfortable in Egypt, right? As we said, uh, Bnei Yisrael, paru vayishretzu vayirbu vayatzmu b'mod mod otam, the land became filled with them, and right after that, vayaka melech adosh al Mitzrayim. Bnei Yisrael had become custom to being in Chutz Laaretz, custom to being in exile. Say so tolerated it uh, as a matter of fact before the uh, b b before the Sheba Mitzrayim started they enjoyed it they were happy there they vayeya chazuba 
This is what Hashem is saying. We have to deprogram ourselves from being in Galut mode, in exile mode Judaism. And that's one of the messages, perhaps the greatest message in this week's Parsha. But read a little further. It says at the end of this Pasuk, right? And then it says, Then I will bring you into the land. So it seems that the Vlakahti etchem Lilaam Vahaiti Lachem Lelohim is part of Veheveti, or the other way around. Veheveti etchem alaretz. You will be, when I take you unto me to be a people, God says. And I and you will know that I am the God. I am your God who took you out of Sivlot Mitzrayim, this tolerance of exile mo Judaism. Then Veheveti etchem alaretz. You will be, you will enter into the land and God will be our king, Leo Lamvad. Realize that it's this Sivlot Mitzrayim, this tolerance, this getting used to being in Galut that is one of the causes of most of the problems that we have. Um, interesting. Venatati Lachem Morasha. Ani Hashem. Hashem says after Mevetiy um, Etchem Elaretz, Asher Nasati Ad Yadi, Lateto Tam, Lateto Tal Avram LiYitzchak UliYakov, and Atati Lachem Ota Morasha. God says, I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you as an inheritance, the land that I promised to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. I will give to you as an inheritance. Where else do we see this term Morasha? Uh, Morasha is more than a Yerusha. It's, it's a birthright. It, it, it's a tradition almost, right? A, a birthright that was given to us. One other place. Torah Tzivalanu Moshe, Morasha Kihilat Yaakov. Two things are given to Am Yisrael as a Morasha, as a birthright. The Torah and Eretz Yisrael. They are inseparable. They are inseparable. One cannot fulfill the Torah correctly outside of Eretz Yisrael. Only Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and the Torah HaKadosha are the birthrights of Am Yisrael. The only two times we see Morasha used in the Torah. So, the Parsha then in Shani goes into a whole backstory about Moshe Rabbeinu, right? We, it says, uh, Ruvain Bechar Yisrael, we go Ruvain Shimon Levi, Levi we go Amram Yocheved, Moshe, Aaron, Miriam, and then that's it. <laughs> the Torah does a backstory on Moshe Rabbeinu, it starts with Ruvain because we go in order, we get to Levi. Interesting, we said uh, in Parshat Vayechi about the Birchot Yaakov, how Yaakov said uh, Levi has to be divided because of their kanaut, their zeal, their zealousness for Hashem. Interesting, who comes from, who comes from Levi? Moshe Rabbeinu. So who is this guy Moshe Rabbeinu? I, there we see Charlton Heston in all his glory, right? He wasn't Charlton Heston, although Chuck Heston did a phenomenal job. I mean, nobody could ever do it again. Anytime they tried, it was like, nah, it's not the same thing. Anyway, so who is this Moshe guy? He's a Levi like me, like being part of the tribe. Moshe was an orphan child, right? We know the story, the water, the basket, float, right? Miriam goes, hires Yocheved, Basia hires Yocheved to be the wet nurse. He grows up in the palace, but he's basically an orphan in the palace of Paro. Comes he's around 20 years old, 
he does a little uh, Google is your friend and figures out that he's Jewish. I don't know if it's the whole Memnit story. I doubt it. Right, finds out that he's Jewish, goes out one day, sees an Egyptian beating a Jew, and like we said last week, he didn't go to Congress, didn't, get, didn't speak to the Gang of Eight or Nancy Pelosi. He whacked the guy. Now he's a refugee for murder at the ripe old age of 20. He runs off into the desert. Fast forward, I don't even know how many years, because supposedly he did this whole uh, detour through Ethiopia, becoming their king, if you read the Medrash and the Alkut Me'am Loes. I mean, there's fascinating stories about this 60-year gap that's almost not dealt with at all in the Torah. Shows up in Midian, marries Tzipora, Harsinai, back to Egypt, he's 80. He was a refugee, wanted for murder, disappears, not well received by the Jews when he gets back there. He vashed them, Otanu, you made us stink in the, eye, in the eyes of Paro because of the, you know, uh, he said, I'll let my people go. And then they had to go with the straw at night. Uh, he wasn't exactly Mr. Popular. Moshe Rabbeinu was a complete outsider. I know you think I'm um, trumping, Trump's an outsider. Not the point. The point is he was the Moshe on Shel Yisrael. And he had to come completely from outside. First of all, he had to come from Shevet Levi because Shevet Levi were never really slaves. And not only that, he had to not be part of the whole Egyptian political. I mean, even though he was, grew up in the palace, so he had, he had the makings of a leader, of a manig, of a king. Really, Moshe was the first king of Israel, if you, you know, really figure it out, but he had the bearings of a king, the royal bearings, but he didn't come from the Sivlot Mitzrayim. He wasn't tolerating being a, uh, he wasn't tolerating being a slave. He, he hadn't even been in the country for 60 years, right? He was a complete outsider in the Moshe Anshel Yisrael, Mashiach ben David, you should come to Meir of Yemenu. He is going to surprise all of us because he's going to be a complete outsider somehow. But it ain't what we're expecting. So this, who, this is who this Moshe guy was. Comes in, right? Comes on the scene. And we know when he was back on Har Sinai, Hashem gave him these signs. The staff threw it on the ground, turns into a snake. The hand, the leprosy, the blood. What's the story? Moshe Rabbeinu was given these signs by Akadosh Baruch Hu to tell Paro, I'm on to you, Paro. Ramses. I'm on to you. You are going to go and say that the Jews, what, what did we say in last week's Parsha? that the Egyptians accused the Jews of dual loyalty. Hello, the, the, the most obscene of the, uh, of the anti-Semitic tropes. We dealt with it last week. But they were forked tongue, lying. They knew damn well, darn well, that's a Torah shear. They, they knew that that is like the most untrue thing, yet they they push the narrative. They use the MSM to tell everybody that the Jews are disloyal. Hence, the snake. That's the first sign. The second sign is the sign of leprosy. Leprosy, you get why? Lush and hara for evil speech. Again, they spoke evil about B'nai Yisrael. True, uh, untruths. Untruths, but just pure hatred. So they, the leprosy was the other sign, but the leprosy happened on Moshe. Why did Moshe have to suffer the leprosy on that sign? Because Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hain lo yaminu bi. They're not going to listen to me. All right, he was, wasn't wrong. But it didn't matter because he spoke against B'nai Yisrael. And as we know, that was his ultimate 
uh, punishment for not going into Eretz Yisrael was he called, he called Bnei Yisrael Mamrim, right? Rebels. Um, and then there's the sign of the blood. The sign of the blood, you take the blood from the Nile and pour it down in front of Paro. Why? Because Hashem is telling Paro, you tried to do this throw the kids into the water thing and you think nobody was looking. That's why you use the water because it covered up your sin. I'm on to you. I know that the Nile is running red with blood. And then, of course, we come to the plagues. And the first of the plagues was the Nile running red with blood. Again, to show the world you can't hide your mass murder. And then the frogs, the noise of the yelling of the taskmasters. Actually, I, I've been told that the worst of the plagues, of, of course, other than the firstborn, the worst of the plagues was the frogs because the frogs robbed the Bnei uh, the Bnei Israel, the, the, the Egyptians robbed the Bnei Israel, but they, the Mida Keneged Mida, the measure for measure, was that the frogs robbed them of sleep and of and of any moment of uh, of sanity. People went completely insane. the The worst deaths during the plague of frogs were suicide. People were killing themselves. They just couldn't take the noise and the constant. The, the, the frogs went into the bodies through the orifices and into the food and into the ovens. They were ubiquitous. They were the, the worst of the plagues, again, other than Makat Bachorot, was the frogs. The lice for not letting the Bnei Yisrael wash, the the skin disease again, the shchin, the wild animals because they they beat the Jews to death, so they had the animals come upon them and tear them asunder, and of course the hail um, that went after their food. It's very interesting that <clears throat> during the first five of the plagues, it says that Paro hardened his heart. Paro hardened his heart. It says, uh, Paro es libo. And by the second five plagues, it already says, Vayechazak Hashem et lev Paro. What's the difference? During the first five, Paro still had Bechira. I mean, he always had Bechira, but he chose not to let the Bnei Yisrael go. By the time he was already through the fifth plague, it was like Hergel of Echlateva. He had almost lost his ability to choose. That was it. He was already done. They say when a person chooses wrong so many times, at some point Hashem says, fine, you know what? I'm done with you. Go ahead. Here you go. Hey, here's whatever you want in Olam Hazah. But Ive when it comes to Olam Haba important message about the importance of making the right choices. Okay, uh, Shabbat Himakar HaBracha, listen to Walter, Bishomer Shabbos. Um, the best way to show Hashem how much we appreciate everything that he does for us is by keeping his mitzvot, and in particular, the mitzvah of Shabbat, where we attest that Hashem created the world, and he took us out of Egypt, as we're learning about right now. So thank you all for tuning in to Jerry's Parsha Ponderings. Uh, come on back next week. We'll deal with the final three plagues and... The big sound and light show of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Have a great Shabbos, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.